sorrowful night, a night of darkness and sorrow and pain. Right now, I am enveloped in darkness because what Wolfgang is going to be experiencing tonight is something that he did not expect. Do you hear that? Do you hear the voices? I think the book is calling to me. Well, shall we get started then? As I sit waiting in the seclusion of my carriage interior, I smell the smoke filling the woods. Too soon I hear the horrific cries of Michael's family as they watch their brother burn with their home, their mother, and all they know. Why am I so weak? With the jostling of the carriage, I know Cronklick is aboard his post. A quick snap of the rain signifies our departure. In time, the smoke clears and the ride returns to normalcy. I watch the trees stream by quickly as neither Cronklick nor myself speak. The sun is well on its descent by the time we come to rest the horses for a bit. We are at the crossroads where merchants have set up their wares. I remain in the coach pondering in silence the horrors that were committed earlier. I imagine the boy biting his mother's neck while she was holding him close, such a disturbing thought. A pair of yellow moths flutter by in the nearby wood. Those are Diana's favorites. Cronklick comes back moments later holding a few bags of herbs. He shakes them with pride down below at me. Pure bergamot from the hills of Ashton. He takes my silence as a sign to press on. When the day lingers, the sky slowly changes color. Unlike other investigations, today was exceptionally taxing on the mind. The letter mentioned nothing of children. The carriage takes a hard left and soon we are out of the Cordova woods and back on the great Carpello Road, where I see the darkening clouds of approaching night. But the sunset itself is beautiful. As I jostle about the carriage, what wonderful pastel colors the sky makes, from yellows to orange, and now to pink, cascading to purple, and now to red. I pause a moment and realize something isn't right. I stick my head out as far as I can from the carriage window, straining my neck in an awkward angle. James, do you see that? Just as I finish the question, I look up to see Cronklick loading a crossbow with one hand. Indeed I do, sir, he says, putting down the weapon and grabbing a second one. Again, I look off toward the horizon and my speculation is correct. The village of Roland is ablaze. Don't stop the carriage, I say, as I grip the edge of the window and hoist myself onto the post next to Cronklick. He's not phased. I'll take over the driving. You just keep loading. With reins in hand, I lash out hard, commanding the pair of mares to go faster. Froth drizzles from their mouths. Their nozzles miss with moisture. Without mercy, we descend into the valley at lightning speed, catching the occasional rock with bone-joring force. I hear the tension on the wooden wheels, the bearings rattling in their sockets. Already in the distance, I hear the raging fright of the villagers rising into the night, their wails ghastly, and, they, and then slowly, one by one, pair by pair, we pass villagers running for their lives. There is no time to stop and ask questions. I dodge a man running straight for the carriage, delirious and terrorized, flailing his arms about his face. We pass Alberston Church, avoiding as many potholes and fires as possible. Cronklick nearly falls from the post. 
I grab his expensive suit, tearing one of his sleeves. Straight ahead of us, monsters crowd the streets. Bogarts with their sharp claws and papery skin. Caretakers with their skeletal bodies and swinging lamps. They raise the town, pummeling villagers into the ground, trampling them with their bones and claws. Everything is chaos. Kronklik fires off a shot, piercing a Bogart's face, splitting its one eyeball into two. He sets the crossbow down and readies the next. The thought of reaching my family makes me frantic. I crack the whip harder, demanding absolute obedience from my horses. The carriage barrels straight into a crowd of caretakers, smashing their bones into a storm of shrapnel. Wheels grind over the remains as Kronklik hurriedly tosses bone from the post. My cloak flaps in the rush of the wind, cracking as loud as the rains. Focusing on not overturning the carriage, my eyes lock only on the dim outline of the road ahead. I hear Kronklik shouting in my ear, They're aboard! he says, but I dare not look. He vanishes from my side for too long, and I chance glancing back. He is gone. There is no time to ponder. He would tell me to keep going. I crack the whip harder. I see Wolfgang Manor in the distance through the smoke. My pulse quickens when I see it's on fire. Flames rise high from the rooftops. A hand grasps my wrist suddenly, and the team of horses veers from the road missing a ditch. It is all I can do to steer the carriage true while pulling Kronklik back onto the post. We are at the avenue of tall conifers racing along its path, and everything is a blur. We don't stop till we're at the head of the long drive into the entrance. Bodies of my servants are strewn about, arms torn from limbs, necks raked open. All of the pumpkins and squash are smashed, the front door splintered into a thousand pieces. Jumping down from the carriage, I run, discarding my long mantle for better movement. The chill of the night stabs my bones, but my adrenaline rushes from my heart and keeps me warm. Kronklik follows suit, strapping a crossbow over his shoulder and carrying another in his hands. Without his top hat, and with his hair all askew, his appearance is that of a mad scientist. We pass into the shadow of the house, covering each other. The smoke is thick inside, but no visible flames have penetrated the main part of the house. I pull the Bawaka blade from my hip. As I step over two servants, their faces have been ravaged. Gore covers the walls. Room by room, we search for signs of Dorian and Diana, upstairs and down, but there is no sign of either. Just as I begin to ascend the steps for a second look, Kronklik grabs my shoulder. Out there! Look! Through one of the windows overlooking the back courtyard, I see my wife lying in the dirt in the same spot where she stood with my son this morning. I run for the nearest door. Bursting into the courtyard, I stumble past more bodies and fall to the earth before her. Fire rages all around in the hay, the rooftops and the second floors. Tears stream across my face as I hold my hands before her, deciding how to go about examining her. Her clothes are disheveled and blood cakes her fingernails. I reach to her neck and wait. Her skin is cool to the touch, but a pulse resonates from within. Dear God, she's alive! I cradle her body into my arms, hugging her ever so close to me, feeling what warmth is left. She is slowly slipping away into the cold night. Her breath is shallow. I barely make out the words she whispers into my ear. Oh, sweet breath, Diana. I listen as best as I can. She stammers words that do not make sense. I cannot stay here, my love. I must go. Diana, no! You are delirious, my dear. Stay with me. Everything will be all right, I promise. I grip her tighter in my arms as if to prevent her spirit from leaking into the night. Curse you, Tenor. I will always love you. Those are her last words before she is gone. Diana, 
Diana, don't do this to me. Don't leave me, please. My tears become sobs as I gently place her limp body down. Her skin is so pale, a bluish white. A thought enters my mind, much like when I was in the cottage with the boy. I turn her head to see the other side of her neck, and I tremble. She has been bitten. I sit lost in the haze, staring into the heavens above, then at the fire raging all around me. Gently, I place Diana's arms to her side, and I push the strands of hair from her face. She looks so peaceful, but I know when first light comes, she will rise to the horrors of evil. This last act as her husband, I must do. It is all I can do. And I curse the night for allowing evil to prevail here. Pulling a wooden stake from my belt, I grip it with both hands and raise it above me. I scream into the heavens for absolution and drive the holy wedge deep into the heart of my loving wife. Despite her cold flesh, her blood is warm as it spurts onto my face and hands. Her blood so nurturing, the very blood that gave life to my son. I hear the last gasp of earthly dwelling escape her lungs. And I know that it is over. With tears still dripping from my chin, I stand before her ravaged body to say goodbye for the last time. She will stay here and burn with the evil that has befallen Wolfgang Manor. When Kronklik approaches, he does his best to avoid my eyes as I turn away. Kronklik, there is much work to be done. Salvage what supplies you can. Already, the manor has turned into a blazing inferno, and there isn't much time to prepare. Disjointed thoughts race through my brain as we pack the carriage with rations of food. Thoughts of my son and Jacquem. I can see nothing to indicate their whereabouts. Where did they go? Alive or dead, I need to find them. There are wisps of smoke smoldering on Kronklik's suit from the heat of the manor. He leans against the carriage, taking deep breaths. Tenor, what will we do now? I take a moment to look at him with gratitude, and then turn to watch Wolfgang Manor cave in on itself. The night sky is lit with sparks and bits of fallen building. We both witness the sight in awe at the sheer power of the element. But in the next moment, I force myself to snap my thoughts together. Kronklik has done so much for me. I couldn't ask for a better servant. No, a better partner. We need to find answers, I mutter, motioning for him to follow me. And we won't find him here.
What's up guys? Thank you so much for watching my video. If you liked what you saw today, go ahead and hit the like button, add your comments to the video, and hit the subscribe button right there on the screen. I'd really appreciate it. I'll be posting a new chapter of Wolfgang every week, so make sure you stay tuned. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.